Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. We'll just um, give everyone a minute to arrive and settle in, so we'll make a start in a minute's time. So uh, sit tight and see you soon. Hello everyone, thank you very much for coming and welcome to um, Deportation Union Databases for Expulsions. Uh, this is the second in our series of webinars launching and exploring the report Deportation Union Rights, Accountability and the EU's Push to Increase Forced Removals, hosted by us at Statewatch and by the Transnational Institute. Uh, as those of you who joined us in last month's webinar on attempts to recast the 2008 Returns Directive will know, uh, Statewatch um, is a non-profit organisation um, providing a service for civil society to encourage informed discussion and debate through the provision of news, features and analysis backed up by full text documentations so that people can access primary sources and come to their own conclusions. Um, all of our work, including research publications, analyses, news and archives is free to access via our website um, and you can support our work by making a donation. Uh, we're about a month into our fundraising campaign and want to say a huge thank you to um, for all your support so far. Um, if you haven't yet donated or are new to State Watch and are interested in donating, then please do have a look at our support page, um, especially if you find today's webinar useful or interesting. Um, also on that, if you are unable to attend our last webinar in this series, you can also access that um, via our website or via the Transnational Institute's um, YouTube channel. Um, and this webinar will also be recorded um, and available on the same platforms as well. The Transnational Institute, who are co-hosting today, um, are a research and advocacy institute with an international reputation for carrying out well-researched and radical critiques um, and anticipating and producing informed work on key issues long before they are mainstream concerns, advocating alternatives that are both just and pragmatic. Um, my, my name is Jane Kilpatrick. I've worked with State Watch uh, for about a year and a half uh, on the project EU Justice and Home Affairs Agencies, Transparency, Accountability and Fundamental Rights, um, leading State Watch's research on Frontex, the European Border and Coast Guard Agency. Uh, I contributed research to Deportation Union, which was co-authored by Chris Jones, who we'll be hearing from directly a bit later, uh, and Mariana Chiatti, who will be presenting at our final webinar in this series, uh, which will be in December. Um, and that will be all about Frontex's role in deportations. Um, so please do sign up if you are interested in attending and we'll come back later on uh, with a link as well. Uh, so this webinar is based on the report Deportation Union Rights, Accountability and the EU's Push to Increase Forced Removals, an investigative report published by State Watch in August. Um, it examines recently introduced and forthcoming EU measures designed to increase the number of deportations carried out by um, national authorities and Frontex. And as we explore in one chapter of that report, and we'll be looking into in detail today, the EU is expanding a host of databases used for migration and border control. New systems are being developed to ensure the biometric registration of almost all non-EU nationals in the Schengen area. Under the moniker of interoperability, the data held in these systems is being interconnected and used in new and controversial ways. Frontex has been given an increasing role in the design and operation of databases used to facilitate expulsions. So to begin to explore the role of these databases and Frontex in ongoing efforts to step up deportations, I'll now introduce our three speakers for, for today. Uh, so we'll first hear from Dr. Niovi Bavula, who is lecturer in migration and security at Queen Mary University of London. Um, and she will discuss today EU databases and interoperability. Uh, Niovi is Associate Editor of the new Journal of European Criminal Law, 
um, and as a qualified lawyer, Niovi now publishes on EU immigration, criminal law and privacy law. Uh, as an expert in EU large-scale information systems, Niovi has been called on as an expert consultant by the European Commission, European Parliament and the Fundamental Rights Agency and will soon be publishing a monograph exploring the privacy and data protection challenges of EU-wide centralised information systems. Um, Chris Jones will be discussing Frontex's information systems, drawing from research that informed the Deportation Union report. Chris is a journalist and researcher, and since our last webinar in this series has stepped into Tony Bunyan's shoes as the new Executive Director of Statewatch. Uh, his work focuses on civil liberties, police powers, migration control and surveillance technologies. And Petra Molnar will be presenting today reflections from her field research with people on the move in Greece and the impacts of rising surveillance technology on them. Petra is a lawyer specialising in migration, human rights and technology, currently working with European Digital Rights or EDRI on AI and discrimination. Petra's current work explores the impact of algorithms on vulnerable populations such as migrants and refugees. Uh, so, um, so we'll hear first from Niovi, then Chris and then Petra, and there will be time for a few questions after each intervention. And we also have about 20 minutes set aside for audience questions and panel discussion at the end of the webinar. Um, Niovi does have other commitments um, immediately, well, um, uh, a bit early on. So um, please do make sure to send any questions in the Q&A box for her while um, she's giving her presentation first. Uh, so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Niovi Bavula and invite her to give her intervention. Can you hear me all? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, thank you so much, Jane and Chris, for uh, the introduction and the invitation to today's event on Deportation Union. And congratulations on this highly topical and interesting report that was recently published. So in this intervention, what I would like to provide are certain reflections on the configuration and the reconfigurations of uh, EU-wide information systems for information asylum uh, control into tools uh, in reinforcing force removals for EU nationals. So to the uninitiated audience, although I assume everyone is pretty much uh, already somewhat acquainted with information systems, the, in the past few decades, the landscape of EU information systems has significantly proliferated. So in addition to the currently operational systems, the Schengen information system, Eurodac, and the Visa information system, in the near future, three new uh, systems are going to be um, created at the pipeline. pipeline. Uh, the NGX system, uh, European Travel Information and Authorization System, and the ECRIS uh, for uh, third country nationals. So this creates a somewhat a puzzle of new information systems that will result that in the near future, as Jane mentioned earlier, pretty much uh, no EU national will not be monitored in at least one information system them unless those who do not have any connection, any benefit from free movement rights. So these systems have been largely created either as multi-purpose tools from the outset, or as in the case of the Schengen information system, under an overarching purpose of security that can capture a series of other purposes. So in the past few years, the impetus to reinforce returns of regular migrants is a given. So we've seen that in addition to reforms to the return directive as per the previous seminar, uh, there have been other initiatives in order to, um, uh, to, um, to, um, to have like uh, to reinforce uh, force removal, such as for instance, the changes in the visa code, uh, which have been acting as a stick and carrot approach whereby nationals of city countries of origin uh, generating regular migrants will be penalized if they do not receive back irregular migrants. So how do information systems fit within this uh, complex landscape in relation to returns? So one could distinguish information systems into two categories. On the one hand, we have certain databases such as the entry access system and the, forecoming, and the visa information system who have as ancillary objectives, the identification of third country nationals who may not fulfill the condition of regular stay. So that's one part. So on the other hand, and this is what I'm particularly interested in, we have uh, other information systems, particularly the Schengen information system and Eurodac, who are expected to have a more prominent role in enforcing returns of irregular migrants. 
So starting with Eurodac, Eurodac has been traditionally conceived as a tool in support of the Dublin system for the determination of the member state responsible for uh, the um, examination of an asylum claim. However, we've seen that progressively since the past few years, the purpose of Eurodac has been uh, expanded in order first to encompass law enforcement access by uh, law enforcement authorities in Europol, but more recently since in 2016 uh, and uh, of course, informed by the um, uh, massive influx of refugees uh, in the EU, we've seen that uh, Eurodac will be, was be further transformed into a tool for wider migration purposes. This was the term that was used in the proposal of 2016, which was in the framework of then reforming and creating the third generation of common European asylum system. However, because of, this, because of this change in the material scope of the system, the Commission also foresaw an expansion of the personal scope of Eurodac in order, for instance, to encompass uh, the storage of personal data of um, uh, irregular migrants found irregularly staying on national territory, which at the time, at, the, at this point, are only compared, but they are not stored in the system, uh, but also extending Eurodac to include further data apart from fingerprints, which is currently the case, to also photos and other personal data, reducing also the age of fingerprinting uh, from the age of 14, which is currently the case, to the age of 16, uh, and uh, removing certain types Time limits on the use of fingerprints taken for persons who had crossed the border uh, irregularly and uh, yeah, creating a new obligation to collect the data of all irregular migrants over the age of six. Uh, so, uh, as argued elsewhere, this has led uh, to Eurodac being transformed from a database with fairly limited capacities into a fully fledged multi purpose tool. Uh, so, this configuration of Eurodac has been directly linked to three main reasons. The failure of doubling within which Eurodac was inextricably linked. Uh, signified um, that uh, the legitimization of Eurodac as a support tool of Dublin could no longer be maintained. Uh, and secondly, secondly, that the, um, the de facto enlargement of the purpose of Eurodac as an identification tool, even though identification is not listed among the purposes of Eurodac, uh, necessitated a revision of the legal basis in order to, so that the reality match uh, legislation. And finally, interoperability, so the possibility of bringing databases together and um, exploring links between the different data aggregated under the auspices of interoperability signified that uh, the standards in Eurodac need to match the standards in other information systems. So this first uh, proposal of 2016, which meant that the Euro Eurodac would be used for wider migration purposes, this includes uh, the return of uh, irregular migrants. So Eurodac would be shifting from an asylum administrative tool into a more coercive uh, migration tool. However, none of these reforms were directly linked to the primary use of Eurodac as a tool to support Dublin. So all this expansion is not related to the functioning of Eurodac as an asylum tool, but was uh, informed by other considerations. So the uh, revised proposal, which was um, put forward by the Commission on the 23rd of September of 2020, was maintains this expansive approach, approach to Eurodac. So the 2020 proposal, it, it does not fall much further than the previous one. However, it further expands the purpose in the sense that interoperability rules are already embedded within the new proposal. Uh, and importantly, the taking of personal data will be uh, further expanded during the screening process at the external borders. So already Eurodac could be used once individuals would apply for international protection, but with the screen process, we move extraterritorially. So this is a particularly important issue that uh, I can further reflect on further on. Um, the issue here is whether we have a problem with the purpose limitation principle. 
Um, after all, this principle forbids processing of personal data for additional purposes than those that were originally foreseen, if those are incompatible with the original purpose. I, uh, one could argue that this incompatibility, when we're talking about immigration and asylum purposes in general, is a little bit difficult to be found. Uh, however, and therefore, the, the previous limitation principle may not be particularly helpful. However, we do have a problem with a rule of law more generally uh, related to the foreseeability of using Eurodac data in other contexts. So let's say that someone like an asylum seeker is fingerprinted today for the purpose under the Recast through that regulation of 2013. Uh, and uh, with subsequent revision of Eurodac in the next couple of years, Eurodac data may be used not only for them to be allocated to the member state responsible, but also for their return. This creates a rule of law problem because it is may not be foreseeable for the asylum seeker that their data may be used in this coercive um, uh, way, which is a little bit unrelated to the original purpose for which they provide the data and for which they have been informed at the time of collection. So at the time of the collection, the uh, right to information involved these particular uses of data, which in the future may expand and this right to information will not cover the additional purposes. Uh, the second clear example of a database which has been revamped already with the aim of assisting in returns is the Schengen Information System. As you all know, the Schengen Information System has been operational since 1995 and contains alerts on unwelcome uh, or uh, wanted individuals and objects, including irregular migrants. So uh, let's go a little bit deeper as to the rules under which irregular migrants may be entering the system. So going back to the convention implementing the Schengen Agreement as um, and specifically Article 96, uh, which was replaced by Article 24, Paragraph 3 of uh, the Schengen Information System Regulation uh, of, 20, to, of 2006, maintained that an alert may be entered in relation to an irregular migrant when the decision by an administrative authority or court is based on the fact that the third country national has been subject to a measure involving expulsion, refusal of entry or removal that includes or, or is accompanied by a prohibition on entry based on a failure to comply with national regulations on entry and residence. So uh, we had a very specific rule and that specific rule also uh, was subject to um, an individual assessment. So individuals or in respect of whom alerts were to be entered in the Schengen information system, how to understand go an individual assessment in light of the principle, in line with the principle of proportionality before the authorities would decide to enter an alert in the system. However, we see that in the recent reform of the Schengen Information System in 2018, we have the adoption of a separate regulation, 1860 of 2018, whereby all return decision will, the decision will be recorded in the system. What does it mean in practice? In practice, it means that the principles of proportionality and the individual assessment, which were and are still the key components uh, to measure the lawfulness of Schengen information system alerts, have gone out of the window in lieu of a very securitized approach of maximum surveillance of irregular migrants. So uh, in the past, going back a bit on the story behind these alerts, in the past, there had been uh, a series of criticism that this rule in the convention implementing the Schengen agreement uh, uh, before it was uh, revised in 2018 had been criticized because the EU legislature did not have any harmonized rules. Uh, and, because, and because of that, there were divergent practices at national level. So in practice, what would happen is that a specific member states like Italy and Germany would um, put en masse alerts in the second information system after an asylum seeker had been refused uh, 
their claim or um, irrespective of whether there had been an entry ban introduced against the third country national, uh, an irregular migrant. So the expansion of the Schengen information to a system as a tool for returns has been used, in my view, as a motor for the EU legislature to bypass the individual assessment, to bypass the principle of proportionality and lead into a harmonization uh, a de facto harmonization, which, however, has been to the lowest common denominator uh, and uh, a race to the bottom in terms of the standards that will be applicable. Uh, so uh, I will stop here with certain reflections. I, I hope to have raised a few uh, concerns as to whether uh, and how information systems are transformed in order to assist in, um, in uh, um, enforcing uh, returns of irregular migrants. Uh, the key issue for me is how far a multi-purpose tool can go uh, before we can say that this is a violation of the rule of law and uh, how um, certain embedded principles in the design of certain information systems have really started to go out of the window uh, in order to assist in um, the pursuit of objectives which may not have been originally conceived and or objectives that in other information systems are merely considered as ancillary. Thank you very much, Niovi. That was a really um, thorough and comprehensive um, look at all of these new and updating constantly systems. Um, I'll just remind um, our audience, if, oh yes, um, if you do have any questions for our panellists, please share them um, throughout the webinar in the Q&A um, section. Um, so there's the chat and then there's also the Q&A for um, questions as we may miss them as they come up in the chat. Um, we have one question uh, so far for Niovi. Um, under the pact, the um, new EU pact on asylum and migration, people may be channeled to the return procedure after the screening procedure. The proposal for the screening regulation makes a number of references to data processing for identity and security checks. What are the biggest concerns under this regulation with respect to the privacy and protection of personal data? Um, so that's for Niovi, though I'm sure Chris and um, Petra, you're also very welcome to give your reflections. Okay, uh, do I reply now? Can I have a short think about it before I reply? Is that okay? Yes, <laughs> okay, sure. yes I think it's quite a thoughtful question. I wonder yes, if I could have is. any reflections on that in the meantime. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I would, oh, sorry, Naomi, carry on. No, no, it's okay. I will have to think about it uh, because it's a little bit specific and I will return uh, with certain comments. Yeah, it's extremely specific, so I can't actually answer that right now, unfortunately. Um, I will say that um, we, we can um, interrupt Neovi, well, uh, accompany Neovi's thoughts with a short plug for um, another report we published this year, which uh, looks at some of the systems Neovi was talking about, the entry exit system, the travel information and authorization system and the visa information system, uh, and not how they're used to enforce removals, but how they're going to be used to uh, profile and risk assess people who are just visiting uh, the Schengen area, so holiday makers and business travellers and things. Um, and there is a link um, to that in the chat if anyone would like to look at that. And that's another aspect of all these databases and information systems that are being either expanded or set up um, as we speak. Having said that, I don't know if uh, Neovi, you'd like to comment on this um, question now or whether you'd like to come back to it later. Um, okay, yes. So the I, I have to admit that I haven't had the opportunity to check all the rules in the screening regulation. I am aware with the general, um, or basically what the, the pact is all about and how Eurodac is going to fit in this new uh, strategy on immigration and asylum. So a key question, in general has to do with the extraterritorial application of EU data protection law in respect of procedures that take place before the entry of individuals uh, on national level, on a national territory. So I think this is a, a key aspect that needs to, 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 to be held in mind as to how we um, 
how this can take place and uh, how there is uh, and, and how we um, make sure that indeed the charter rights are going to be applied effectively in procedures or in which take place even before individuals reach the, the national territory, the EU territory. I think that's a key issue that I, I would like to highlight uh, as a starting point. And if I have any more comments specific on uh, that question, I will, I will get back and uh, step in as well again. Thank you very much. Um, I had, um, perhaps just before we move on to Chris's speech about um, Frontex particularly and, um, and database use, um, I wondered, whether um, like whether there's any particular delay foreseen as a result of the pandemic and also the ongoing difficulty with negotiating the next multi-annual financial framework. Um, so I don't know, actually any of our speakers may be placed to well, answer this, but um, obviously all of this, um, the new databases, the staffing required to manage them and um, linking them all to each other requires quite an, um, an extensive um, financial investment. Um, does that st and and on the other hand, um, the pandemic has been used to justify a lot of extra surveillance, um, particularly regarding um, biometric surveillance. So I wondered if there's any kind of indication um, about how how all of this may be impacted or delayed or or not at all. Is that question for me? Any of the panelists, actually. <laughs> I, I can say something uh, if if, um, if I if I may. Um, yeah. So um, the the financial side, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm pretty sure they'll hammer out some kind of deal before the end of the year. But um, the technical side of it, of the the interoperability program, which um, you know, it requires interconnecting six different databases or more if you count the Interpol ones, um, building some new ones, et cetera, et cetera. This has hit a bit of a problem because it's technically very ambitious. Um, there was a document published by the German presidency actually made public um, back in uh, April or March, I think, which basically said, um, yes, pandemic, very bad news for implementing this. But even before then, they had a lot of problems with um, coordinating all the work to achieve this. So that this involves quite a lot of at least temporary political centralization because it requires, for example, the entry exit system. It can't be used until every single member state uh, has the necessary national infrastructure in place. And the member states um, obviously have very different capacities to, to set these things up. Uh, even in Germany, they um, have had problems obtaining the necessary staff and specialists to build or design what's required. Um, so the, the Commission started a sort of process, a centralised process of overseeing all this stuff and trying to coordinate all the different ministries at national level involved, but the various goals they have for putting all these things in place have been delayed um, and it remains to be seen how long for, um, I don't know how long uh, anyone's memory is who's here, but some people surely will know that the, what is now the Schengen Information System 2, the one that currently exists, uh, took about 10 years, to, was about 10 years overdue by the time it was implemented, I think. Um, so, you know, government IT, it, it never comes quickly. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Um, okay, so just before we hear from you at more length about Frontex, we have one more question for Niovi. Um, so as the screening regulation will be part of interoperability, um, do you think the concept of interoperability will ever really work in the lands in a landscape of data protection rules that require purpose limitations? Um, our um, audience member can't really put the two together even after their own extensive research. Yes, so I've seen these and a question which are pretty much uh, similar about whether interoperability changes the nature and scope of information systems. Uh, this can be uh, replied together. Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, both, uh, basically, if 
if you go and see some of the work that I have published, I'm a little bit radical in saying that interoperability has negated the relevance of the purpose limitation principle. This had already been done uh, in the context of the Schengen information system, for instance, with having an overarching purpose of security under the auspices of security, many different sub-purposes can be included. Uh, also by creating multi-purpose tools, which can be uh, um, um, consequently uh, further revised and further expanded in terms of their scope, it is absolutely um, certain that unless we're talking about something completely um, disconnected from the original purposes, for instance, the uh, I can't even think of anything. If law enforcement purposes can be put next to immigration and asylum control, then I do not see how other immigration and asylum purposes cannot fit uh, together. So in my view, the uh, interoperability has changed the nature of databases from border and asylum, border management or asylum tools to security systems. And I have, um, I have, I can give you uh, some technical arguments as to how this has taken place. But in, in, as a short answer, the short answer is that definitely purpose limitation is not that relevant anymore as a principle. Uh, we should try to uh, frame the problems in different ways because the purpose limitation principle may not be a efficient tool in order to prevent additional processing and adding new purposes to databases. Uh, but I, generally, that information systems have changed their nature to uh, every uh, system is a multi-purpose one, and every system is related to security into a large, much larger extent. And they are no longer administrative tools, they are more tools of coercion and control, I would say. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks to um, to both of you uh, for answering those questions, and thank you very much to our audience um, for them. Uh, so I'll now ask Chris to um, take the floor and talk to us about Frontex's new databases and information systems. Thank you. I quite like the idea of taking the floor on the internet. I'm not sure what it means. Um, thank you, Jane. Thank you, Niovi, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, so my name's Chris, um, I work for Statewatch, and I'm gonna talk about some stuff that um, we wrote about in the Deportation Union report. Uh, it's quite a long report, you may not have read it all, so hopefully this is going to be more useful than delving into um, the entirety of, of the text. But uh, I think Jane will also share some links to relevant parts of the report in the chat. So if there's anything I say that you wanna know more about or to read up further on, um, you can follow those links um, and find out for yourself. Um, so I'm going to look at or talk about um, what we know about the databases and or information systems, depending on how you want to describe them, that Frontex uses to um, coordinate um, and administer deportation operations um, from the European Union uh, and the role those systems play. Uh, so first I will talk about a bit about the legal powers um, related to those systems. Um, and how that's changed over the last few years, uh, the systems themselves um, and the information that they contain, and then the purposes of those systems for Frontex's activities and also for certain other EU policies um, which relate to, to this area. Um, so uh, in terms of the legal um, background for this, uh, in 2016, there was a new Frontex regulation um, and that introduced a requirement for the agency to coordinate the use of relevant IT systems, uh, relevant being um, used in relation to forced removals. Uh, and that was really the first uh, explicit mention of this kind of thing in uh, one of the, the legal texts underpinning the agency. Uh, and then the 2019 regulation came in um, at the end of that year, I guess almost a year ago now. Um, and that built upon what was in the 2016 one so that added new requirements, um, Frontex now has to develop a model for a national return case management system, like an ideal uh, version of one of these IT systems. Uh, it's supposed to assist um, the member states in developing national systems compatible with that model. 
uh, and it's also supposed to develop its own integrated return management platform. Um, actually, the agency was doing that anyway since at least 2017, before the current regulation was even proposed, but that's not unusual. If you read the report, you'll see in this area alone, there is a, new, a number of things that um, Frontex does on some basis or other, a policy decision, a decision by the executive director, and then they're later legalized by lawmakers. Um, so the practice comes first and then the, the law tends to follow. Um, so uh, in relation to, th there's these different requirements relating to what Frontex is supposed to do with these information systems and how it's supposed to help the member states, but there's nothing in the Frontex regulation that um, is in any way binding on what the member states should do. Uh, however, there is something in the proposal for a new returns directive, which does precisely that. Um, so under that proposal, uh, I think in Article 14, um, national return management systems, like the IT systems used to administer forced removals, would have to be made compatible with the central system, that is Frontex's system, um, so that data can be exchanged with them more easily um and that the agencies at national and eu level can all talk to one another so through the returns directive um you get the mandatory creation of what is an interconnected eu deportation information system um which is quite sneaky in some ways maybe it should have been in the frontex rules but anyway we are where we are um so to be a bit more specific um about these systems um what are we actually talking about. So as far as we understand, there are currently two main systems operated by Frontex with regard to deportations. Uh, one is called the Irregular Migration Management Application, or IRMA, IRMA, um, which provides a sort of big picture overview of the situation in the EU with regard to the number of people due to be returned, where to the situation with regard to identity documents, whether they have them or not, things like that. Uh, then there is another system called the Frontex Application for Return, or FAR, FAR uh, which is a module of the uh, IRMA, of the Irregular, Irregular Migration Management Application. So one sits with inside the other. Uh, and the Frontex Application for Return is more specific. That deals with the management of particular operations. So it allows the agency and the member states to communicate and coordinate the different authorities or personnel um, and the individuals who are going to be Deported. Um, so IRMA, uh, the Irregular Migration Management Application, um, this was initially developed and operated by the European Commission. Uh, I think a couple of years ago it was handed over to Frontex. Uh, and as I said, the purpose is to enhance the EU level coordination of deportations through the provision of general information. Uh, so it gives information on the number of people ready to be returned. Uh, or the number of people who've been issued with a deportation order, um, but lack identification documents. And um, the, the explicit purpose behind it, this is a quote from, uh, I believe, a Frontex document. So I've removed the references from my notes. Uh, but it should give a close to real-time overview of the operational situation in the area of return in order to facilitate the management and return of irregular migrants at EU level. Uh, the Frontex application for return, this module or application that sits inside IRMA. Uh, it's used to manage, like I said, individual operations. Um, again, it's supposed to rationalize or streamline the implementation of removal operations and it enables the management of individual cases. So um, quote from another official document says it pulls together the planned return operations by member states, the announcement of participation in those operations and all communication relating to a Frontex coordinated return operation as well as pre-return assistance. Um, so we have these two systems, they are, they exist and they're being sort of further developed as we speak um, to help implement the new mandate that Frontex has. And what they do, aside from like increasing the efficiency of the removal process, is um, move the agency from, uh, from a reactive role to a more proactive role, or it gives the opportunity for the agency to take a more proactive role. So uh, it's political in that sense, in that it potentially gives more power to the agency. Uh, so under the new regulation, the 2019 regulation, Frontex has to draw up an ongoing operational plan on removal operations, or what's called a rolling operational plan, uh, in that it's allowed to include the dates and destinations of return operations it considers necessary, um, based on the information it can draw from IRMA, 
of uh, on who is where in the EU. Um, you know, are they detained? Have they had an expulsion order issued? Where are they going? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, and this system, IRMA, also allows the member states, uh, the European Commission or Frontex to, to trigger certain measures, um, such as joint return actions, uh, identification missions, or the shared use of facilities. And in the case of Frontex, it's able to, to trigger these actions on its own initiative with the agreement of the member state concerned or at a member state's request. So this is kind of a parallel to what has shifted with in relation to border control operations, whereby rather than Frontex just being requested by a member state, uh, it's allowed to go to the member state and say, oh, we've looked at the numbers and we think you should do this. What do you think about that? So obviously the member state still has the final say, but this is sort of the next step along the road to Frontex being able to tell the member state what to do um, and the member state not necessarily having any say in that. Um, we're not at that stage yet, but you can see how that would be a logical progression of this. Um, so, there's some other purposes to these systems, um, again, related to, to sort of the forced removals policy, uh, but they also relate to the, the EU's new visa code or the visa policy. So within IRMA, um, there's some data sets in there or that are due to be included in there that include the number of uh, deportees who've been issued with a European travel document uh, and have been accepted by the state of destination and the number of people refused readmission at the border of a state of destination. So the number of people who've been removed from the EU and they get to whichever country it may be, and the authorities there say, no, we're not taking this person back. Uh, so this relates to a visa code in the, under the new visa code, uh, which was agreed, I think, in February this year, the European Commission has to make an assessment of the level of cooperation um, with non-EU states uh, with forced removal operations. And those states that are deemed not to be complying sufficiently, um, there's certain potential punishments for them. The price of visas can be raised, the processing times can be slowed, um, or the issuance, issuance of visas can be limited or suspended altogether. Um, and so Frontex's role in this is, is to be data collector. Um, um, there's um, a document we'll publish shortly, actually, which sets out some of the work that is going on on that front. But um, the council itself has said, uh, there's a meeting of the, it was the Integration, Migration and Expulsion Working Party in September 2019 that said the role of Frontex in collecting data will be central to the new, um, these aspects of the new visa code. Um, there's some other issues um, which don't really have time to get into into detail here, but again, you can read the report and read the section on this. Um, but FAR, the Frontex application for return, this contains personal data, therefore, um, it needs certain rules and safeguards on the processing of personal data. Uh, the system was signed off by the European Data Protection Supervisor at some point in 2018, I think, because FAR was introduced after the 2016 regulation. Um, that decision of the EDPS is not public, neither is the submission that Frontex made to the EDPS, so we don't know exactly what was said or what recommendations were made, but the rules for FAR are public um, and they include a restriction on individual data protection rights, which says that um, people can be prevented from accessing their personal data held by Frontex in relation to their removal on a case by case, case by case basis, as long as the application of those provisions would risk jeopardizing the return procedures and individuals can be denied access for reasons of national security, public security and the defense of the member states. So it's presumably the member states authorities that make these decisions about restricting access um, but that's not actually clear in the rules. And one of the issues here that we raised in the report is, you know, there may be mistakes in someone's personal data. Uh, it may be sent to Frontex to facilitate their removal and they may not have the opportunity to rectify those mistakes, which could lead to, I mean, various untoward situations for those people. Um, so just to summarize, uh, under the last two regulations in 2016 and 2019, Frontex has been given increasing powers to set up its own databases and information systems and to coordinate national systems dealing with deportations from the EU. Um, and there are really twin objectives here. Uh, one is efficiency um, to, to spend less, uh, but remove more people. Um, and this is a sort of very bureaucratic kind of um, approach to things. Um, and you can kind of see that if you look at the, in the report, you can see a copy of the table setting out the data sets in the IRMA um, system 
and there certain things are referred to as stocks or flows, which is obviously a way of referring to certain types of data, but uh, it's quite unnerving when you see a group of people who are going to be subjected to forced removal referred to as a stock. Um, it's quite dehumanizing. So the first one is to do with efficiency. Uh, and then there's also a political angle to this in that it obviously grants more powers to EU agencies and institutions. So it's a question of power going upwards, I suppose, as, as the European um, project develops. Um, so this efficiency, uh, this new efficiency we're supposed to get is not going to be achieved just through Frontex's systems, but also obviously their interconnection with national systems, because it's still the member states who are making the decisions and actually putting people through removal proceedings, the legal proceedings, administrative proceedings. Uh, and as I said, the recast returns directive, which is currently under discussion, includes the provisions to, to make those interconnections between the national systems and Frontex mandatory. Uh, just on that point, I'll note that some amendments have been proposed to the returns directive on this, on this issue. Um, the parliament's report on it, um, which was drafted by Tinika Strick, who we had to speak in the last um, one of these webinars, you can watch online, very interesting. Uh, they did not make any changes to that um, article. Uh, the left group, GUI, they want to get rid of it altogether, along with the entire proposal. Um, and Renew Europe, the liberal group, they want to include specific provisions on data protection, and they want the Commission to have to pass a delegated act, um, setting up a specific legal framework for the central system and the national systems, uh, which, if the returns directive has to be passed, then that is probably the best thing we could hope for um, and would add some sort of clarity to what happens to people's data in this situation. Um, so overall, what this means is it's part of a shift towards giving the agency an increasingly proactive rather than a reactive role in um, managing forced removals, as with many other aspects of migration management. Um, and databases and information systems, they're not simply a means for fulfilling the agency's new mandate, but also to expand its role in the future, because the more information it has or has access to, the more leverage and influence and power it can exercise over national authorities. And I will finish there, apart from to say, if you would like us to do more events like this, uh, produce more reports like the one we're talking about, then please donate to State Watch or become a friend of State Watch. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we've got a few minutes now for any questions that have come up um, from either or both of the interventions so far. Um, so do let us know through the Q&A box. Um, we have one question at the moment. Um, thanks for the really interesting presentations. Chris, how is nationality determination or redocumentation dealt with within these systems? At the European Network on Statelessness, we're concerned about authorities' lack of capacity to determine nationality in line with international norms and to identify statelessness amongst people subject to removal or deportation, um, leading to many being subjected to repeated futile return attempts and detention when they have no country to which they can return. What more can we all be doing to address this? Um. So I can't answer specifically how precisely they deal with nationality determination or redocumentation. Um, in FAR, they obviously hold information on people's um, uh, the nationality that they have uh, for the purposes of return, uh, whether that's accurate or not. Again, that may be something that relates to the inability of people to access, potentially to access their personal data. Um, but also in the new Frontex regulation, there are rules which allow um, I've forgotten the name of them. Are they return support teams or something? But basically, the agency is able to deploy uh, teams of staff to a member state at the member state's request, or at least with the member state's consent, uh, to assist with things like identification um, and documentation. So in terms of what we can do to address this, um, I mean, I suppose it might be worth trying to find out what procedures uh, Frontex follows for this, what expertise it has in-house, for example. Do they just send people to assist uh, national authorities and follow their procedures? Or are they, do they have their own uh, methods um, and ideas that they bring to this, this procedure, which may be something interesting to look into? Um, and yeah, I mean, feel free to email us and we, we could talk about that to, to work out an access to documents request or, or something like that.
Oh, thank you very much. Um, okay, if there's no further questions right now, I think um, I'll ask uh, Petra to speak to us um, sort of about the other side of all of this. So we've gone over the policies, the legislation, um, sort of the political aims or um, outcomes of all of this. And um, Petra has uh, some reflections from, um, from research conducted on the ground, um, which might give uh, more of an idea of the actual impacts that this might have on people's lives. Thank you so much for having me and thanks to all of you for tuning in. Uh, my name is Petra and I've been working with uh, EDRI, the European Digital Rights uh, uh, in Brussels, uh, essentially looking at trying to understand how some of these technological interventions are playing out and how they're impacting real people's lives on the ground. Now, before the COVID pandemic, we had all these plans. We were planning to do you know, a much bigger uh, study into this, but of course, um, as with all of us, uh, our project was a little bit impacted, but we were able to do some field research in Greece and in Brussels over the course of the summer. And for those of you who are interested, we will have a report coming out in the next two weeks. But essentially what I do in my work is a little bit of a departure from, from this focus on, on databases and data per se, but it's to look at migration management technology in a broader ecosystem in which it operates and to try and unpick some of the power relations that are inherent behind some of the reasoning why this technology is introduced in the first place. And why I was giving some thought to, you know, wanting to make sure that my intervention today fit into the broader topic of this webinar, you know, a lot of the technologies that we are looking at particularly have to do with automation and algorithmic decision making. And of course, these technologies rely uh, exclusively on databases. And that's why having a critical look at how data is collected about particular communities is really key. Because especially data that will be used to facilitate forced returns and deportations. Because again, it maps onto a very particular reality and technology and data is not neutral. It replicates power relations in the way that our world operates and particular communities become testing grounds or guinea pigs for the way that technology is, is rolled out. Because of course, data gathering is a political exercise, just like the development and deployment of technology. That's why in, in, in my work, um, I'm trying to understand the importance of this kind of broader ecosystem in which this techno-solutionism is um, becoming more and more prevalent. So, you know, we are dealing increasingly with anti-migrant sentiments, criminalization of migration, border externalization, xenophobic um, and far-right um, linkages to, to surveillance and migration too. And now also COVID and biosurveillance. I mean, I think we would be remiss not to think about the impacts of the pandemic and the kind of exacerbation that this will have of some of the technological you know, surveillance uh, tools that might be used, particularly against communities that are uh, made marginalized. Because we already know, of course, that refugees and migrants and people on the move are oftentimes tied to these tropes of you know, bringing in disease and illnesses and needing to be managed and surveilled and controlled. How will COVID be used and potentially co-opted for, for this type of intervention? But just as way of background, when I talk about migration management technology, I'm really talking about a host of uh, interventions that happen before the border, at the border, and beyond the border. But again, it's, it's changing our conception of how a person is moving through the world and as they interact with these different um, interventions and technologies. Because I think there is a lot to be said about trying to have kind of a, a systemic, broader, deeper understanding of how this all fits together. When we're talking about, for example, data gathering in forced migration settings and biometrics, versus drones at the border or dubious experiments like AI lie detectors that uh, we have seen in recent years um, at the European level with, for example, the I border control project. And then even after the fact, after you already cross a border, um, how are these technologies being experienced when we, for example, know that countries are experimenting with automating various facets of their immigration and refugee processing? For me, this is actually where my work started in this area. And perhaps I should have started with this. I'm not a tech person. I'm a refugee lawyer by training. And a few years ago, we learned that Canada as a major receiving country has been experimenting with algorithmic decision-making in its immigration system. Hugely problematic from a human rights perspective. But again, what, what I try and do in, in my work is to foreground the experiences of people who are kind of at the sharp edges of this technological development. 
the communities that are oftentimes left out of the conversation. Because let's be honest, oftentimes it's lawyers and policymakers and academics talking to each other or past each other <laughs> more often than not, without actually thinking about how this plays out on the ground. And that's what we're trying to do with this particular project um, is to, to see how these interventions are actually playing out, particularly these days, again, in this moment of a pandemic with the new migration pact, and most recently, perhaps with, you know, the documented pushback by Frontex. Um, I mean, it's, it's a ripe moment to try and understand how this actually plays out and, and also how people feel about it. So I was able to do a bit of field work um, in Brussels and in Greece over the last few months since uh, about June. And our report will uh, you know, highlight some of these experiences from people. We had an opportunity to actually go to Greece um, and uh, witness the aftermath of the fire in Moria, which was a real important moment to also witness the birth of a new containment center. And it's something that we will be monitoring over the next little while because the discourses around containment, data gathering, biometrics are already coming out. And just so I can break up my uh, monologue, I will show you some photos from my wonderfully talented colleague, Kenya Jade Pinto, that she collected when we were there. Um, let me just share my screen with you. Um, these photos, of course, I should also say, you know, we, we take a very critical um, uh, understanding of photography in the spaces of forced migration because it's really, really important to problematize the types of images that we produce also because oftentimes it very easily devolves into what we sometimes call poverty porn. We don't take pictures of people's faces, well, other than the police, of course, <laughs> but I mean the, the communities and the people that we, we interact with. But we wanted to document, again, this kind of securitization around the new camp and the kind of conversations that were being had, both at the policy level, but also at the individual level. So for example, here you see a group of policemen and women in full hazmat suits um, doing what they do, uh, and yet, you know, COVID for, for the population that we were talking with was an afterthought. It's not hard to imagine when you don't know where you're going to wash your hands or how you're going to meaningfully socially distance. Um, and you will see, I mean, I'm sure you've, of course, been following the situation in, in the island camps. It's, it's not a particular um, COVID friendly uh, area. This, for example, is the COVID um, containment center, I guess we could call it, in the new camp, Karatepe, which was um, but basically this is where people ended up being forced to go after Moria burnt down. And as you can see, you know, barbed wire separates people who are supposedly COVID positive um, from the rest of the population. Again, social distancing becomes very impossible. And you can also see that, you know, um, in a particular area of a humanitarian emergency like this, uh, surveillance and technology might seem like an afterthought, but in fact, nothing could be further from the truth. We were trying to document, you know, how a particular area in the world like this becomes a technological testing ground. And it's been really fascinating how Greece, particularly as a frontier nation, and uh, an area that is you know, sometimes presented as Europe's shield or Europe's guardian is used as a way to test out some of these technological interventions. And Frontex is of course a leading player in this and they have been really positioning themselves in interesting ways. So for those of you who've been following you know, the discourse of Frontex, for example, a few of their press releases early on in the pandemic even, were really explicitly making the linkage between border enforcement, surveillance, and COVID, and really presenting themselves as the leading entity in the EU to do just that. Essentially, you know, we are here to assist with your border enforcement and also with COVID. It's an interesting linkage there, I think, that we really need to pay attention to. Another, you know, um, kind of trope that we saw uh, on the ground is, of course, the inaction of the EU and, and this kind of a sentiment that these particular spaces of experimentation have been left alone to deal with a really difficult and complex problem. And this is a key theme in, in the work that we're trying to do as well. This push towards techno solutionism and this allure of big tech and these quick fixes, again, they don't uh, get at the systemic reasons why people are forced to move in the first place and why they might end up in places like a Greek refugee camp. 
because even though these kind of technological innovations might seem sexy and interesting and also on the geopolitical level there's this major major push for countries to position themselves as ai leaders as technological innovators and yet what does that actually do on the ground why are we focusing on interventions like ai lie detectors and more drones and automating various uh, parts of immigration and refugee applications when we should be thinking about providing clean water and schooling and and you know, resources to civil society that's working on the ground. It's just an interesting way to try and understand how priorities uh, become the priorities that they are. And again, I guess perhaps this is what I really want to focus on the most. The context in which these technologies are developed really matters because, you know, not only do we need to have, I think, a more broader conversation around the impacts that technologies have on the affected communities, but also it's about participation. Who gets to participate in the conversations around proposed interventions? How do people feel about having their irises scanned in lieu of uh, a cash card, for example, as we have been seeing in a variety of refugee camps in Jordan? It also gets at questions around informed consent and the ability to opt out. It's all well and good for you know, international entities to say, well, it's about efficiency. We need access to better data. We need more um, innovative solutions to manage humanitarian crises. But again, how does the affected community feel about it? I mean, how would you feel about it if you had to get your eyes scanned every time you entered a supermarket or if you needed to get your weekly food ration? And if you wanted to opt out, can you really? I mean, if you opt out, maybe you don't eat that week. That's not really free and informed consent. Some of the people that I talked to also really zeroed in on the discriminatory potential of this technology, particularly because technologies get developed in particular places and then deployed in others, right? And we, of course, know that algorithms and automated decision making has a very poor track record when it comes to issues like race and gender. How will, what will this mean in the immigration context when for example, racist algorithms will be imported into decision making. Because oftentimes the people who are again at the center of this might not even know that algorithmic decision making or automated decision making might be impacting their immigration and refugee application. And how do you meaningfully challenge that in a court of law? These are all sorts of questions that we really need to ask ourselves. But again, the context and the ecosystem in which this operates really matters. Because once again, we are seeing a clear example of certain communities being guinea pigs and being the testing ground for this technology. And very little oversight currently exists. There is almost no governance mechanism that can be meaningfully applied to this type of technology. And right now, it's, it's, a, it's an innovation free for all. States are obsessed with, again, using all these solutions to try and get past these intractable complex problems. And yet without really an integrated mechanism to even look at, for example, the human rights impacts of this technology. Again, perhaps it's a philosophical question too. Who gets to participate in the conversations that we are having about what our world will look like? And these technological innovations are a part of it. It's again, the same kind of power dynamic that we've been seeing with policy and law. Now we're seeing it with technology. So again, I, I will perhaps leave it there so that we have enough time for a discussion, but it is really about power and it's about participation and the push from the private sector and big tech to determine what the conversation looks like really needs to be problematized and unpacked because without meaningful participation of people who are on the ground, who are again, the ones that are in, interacting and thinking and being affected by this technology, we really won't be able to move past um, this conversation in a way that would be meaningful for any kind of oversight and accountability mechanism in the future. Thanks so much for letting me share my ideas from our recent project. And yes, please stay tuned for our report. It will be coming out in early November. And uh, we are also rolling out an interesting initiative on tech and migration. So stay tuned. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Petra, and we're really looking forward to, um, to the report uh, publication in November. Um, just before we go into the um, kind of full panel discussion, um, we've had a question. Um, are you able to say briefly what areas your research report will cover, please, um, from Katrina at the Last Rights Project? Sure, yeah, so I can briefly um, tell you about it. Uh, again, it's, it's a carve out of a broader uh, corpus of work that we're hoping to do on mapping some of these ecosystems around migration management tech generally, but really the central idea is to look at uh, automated decision-making 
And in this report, we are trying to map out some of these ideas around power and participation that I talked about, but use kind of the case study of Greece and also some of the conversations that I had with asylum seekers and people who are undocumented in Belgium, uh, again, to kind of tease apart some of their thoughts and feelings about surveillance technology and automation, particularly in, you know, uh, really troubling applications as they're coming across it, as they're moving and during their um, migration journey. And it will also include a set of recommendations for uh, policymakers at the EU level. But really the idea is to start some of these conversations and we hope to follow it up with um, further work in this area. So if anybody wants to get in touch, um, please do. Cool. Um, thank you very much. We've had a, um, a couple of questions about how to get in touch. Um, so firstly, I can say that um, we have um, comms at statewatch.org, um, which is an easy way to contact us and we can pass on any questions. But if any panelists do want to share their contact details, then um, then please do. Um, and I think the same is uh, true of Niovi, who's had to leave us um, as she had a, a pre-existing teaching commitment. Um, but um, if there are any further questions for her, then please do let us know and we can pass them on and get back to you. Oh, yeah. um, yes, uh, so I think uh, Petra's shared her email and is that all right for us to um, pass on now? Or would you rather they come to us and, and then we can pass on to you? Oh, no, no, please. Whoever wants to get in touch anytime. Great, I'll just pop that in. All attendees. Oh, sorry. I thought I was sharing it with all attendees. My bad. <laughs> no, no, I always have to go through each one quite carefully and make sure I'm replying to the right one. <laughs> but yes, so thank you very much for sharing your contact details. I think there'll be a lot of uh, questions and follow up for you. For that was a yeah, really interesting and um, troubling presentation, I think. Um, so we've got a couple of uh, questions in the Q&A box. Um, so do please, um, uh, audience, please submit um, any more you have. We have about uh, 20 minutes uh, to discuss. Um, so we have one, um, Frontex is evidently being used as an expression of the EU's key political orientation. Can or does the EU have the authority to punish or restrict the power of individual EU states that do not comply with Frontex's wishes? Um, and then as a sort of sub question of that, are there any cases already in the public realm that indicate that there has already been inability to agree between Frontex's proposals and the political positions of individual EU states? I feel like this is more of a question for Chris. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> um, in regard to the latter about um, cases in the public realm, there's a, an interesting story in Euroactive today um, about the proposed agreement between the EU and North Macedonia on deploying Frontex teams in North Macedonia. Uh, and apparently Bulgaria is an EU state blocking the adoption of this um, agreement because they disagree with the designation of Macedonian as a language. Um, according to the article, Bulgarian scientists see it as a dialect of Bulgarian. This is despite the fact Bulgaria and Macedonia have signed numerous other international agreements. Um, on a more serious note, I mean, the, um, oh, the question has disappeared. Has it gone? Oh, it's in. Um, Sorry, now it's an answer. So. Yes, I can't keep up yeah. with this technology. Sorry, that was um, me trying to be so does the EU have the authority to punish or restrict the power of individual EU states that do not comply with Frontex's wishes? Um, I would have to look at the rules again to, to remember exactly what the procedure is for certain. Um, with regard to deportations, I don't think there's anything about any sanctions or anything like that. The way I understand it is more a system of political pressure between um, the other member states and Frontex. So let's say, for example, that, um, you know, Frontex now has to do these things called if we talk about border control, for example, Frontex now has to undertake what are called vulnerability assessments, which I'm sure a lot of academics could spend a lot of time picking apart the linguistics of that. It's rather a strange term, uh, which is basically a question of how vulnerable that state's border is to um, irregular um, border crossings and so on. Uh, and Frontex is allowed to say to Greece or whichever other state, you know, we think you need some backup, you need some reinforcement, you need us to send some men with sticks and guns uh, to stand on the border. Um, and obviously that requires Greece's consent, but then there's a lot of things that are going to go on behind the scenes. Um, I think originally, if I remember rightly, in the discussions for the proposal, there was some talk about the council being able to rule that a member state ha had to accept 
um, like a Frontex deployment. I don't think that's in the rules anymore. Uh, I may be wrong. Jane may be able to correct me. Um, so yeah, I don't, it's not, we haven't come to that stage yet whereby I think a member state can be sanctioned. Um, it's a question of political pressure and discussions at the moment. That's where that stands, I think. And Thank just about you. the second half of that uh, intervention, that question about whether there are any cases um, potentially holding Frontex accountable. I mean, all I can say is there's definitely interest and some of us are thinking seriously about it. So perhaps it's another stay tuned <laughs> uh, situation. Thank you. Yeah, it sounds like there's definitely a lot of um, things to look out for. Um, okay, so perhaps another one for Chris, though, obviously, Petra, please uh, uh, interject if you, if you if you want to. Um, how do you see the role of Balkan non-EU countries in the EU deportation policies? Serbia has signed an agreement um, with Frontex and started preparation to join Eurodac database. So um, any reflections on that? Um, I mean... The Balkans is like key, key focus for the EU and the member states with regard to migration policies at the minute, um, as it kind of has been for the last five years, ever since, you know, a million people arrived in Germany, most of them got trains and walked through the Balkan countries on their way. Um, and obviously, the majority of those states are due to join the European Union and are supposed to do things like join the Eurodac database, like um, the questioner says. So, I mean, the role the Balkans play for the EU is stopping people arriving in Europe in the first place, who they, they may let the member states may then wish to deport. Um, but there's also, I mean, again, another thing that didn't make it through to the final um, text on the 2019 Frontex regulation was a proposal to let Frontex assist with deportations from one non-EU state to another non-EU state. So for example, a, um, a Frontex financed deportation flight could have gone from Serbia to Afghanistan or from Kosovo to um, to Turkey. Um, that didn't make it through. That's extremely controversial and that did not get through into the text in the end. But this is obviously on some people's radar as something that might be possible. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot going on in, in that sphere at the minute. We published an article um, a few months ago now uh, along with a document from the council which had undertaken a mapping exercise of what EU member states individually were doing in cooperation with states in the Balkans on migration management and the majority of the, the money and the time that goes into that cooperation is to do with the coercive side of uh, migration control so less to do with integration or reception and more to do with expulsion um, border control etc um, and I think maybe I'll just look that up now I can post a link in the chat so you can take a look at that Cool, thank you, Chris. Uh, yes, yeah, so look out in the chat for any uh, further information. Um, our next question is about the guinea pig testing applications. Uh, surely these guinea pig testing applications can only have the capability of reducing the human being to an inanimate cipher, which must evidently be at log loggerheads with any healthily minded psychologists who have and are being referred to in order that these systems were and continue to be established and developed. Um, so I'm not sure, uh, Petra, you have any reflections on that, on the sort of, um, yeah, psychological evidence um, surrounding these these techniques. Yeah, I mean, I, I take your point. I think oftentimes psychologists are perhaps not at all involved um, because I think the iBorder Control Project is a clear example of, of that. Um, you know, from, sorry, this, that, that I mean, uh, that's the uh, AI lie detector uh, project, pilot project that was introduced a few years ago. From a refugee lawyer's perspective, I mean, it's clear that any psychologist that was involved must perhaps have their license to practice checked because there's just, it's so problematic to assume that a system of quote unquote AI lie detection based on automated decision making is a morally fraught exercise to begin with. Not only it, you know that that's one thing but the other side of it is it's also it just doesn't it just doesn't work it's, it's snake oil and how can an ai lie detector for example deal with differences in cross-cultural communication or the fact that sometimes people don't want to make eye contact with someone of the opposite gender how how will ai systems deal with that that are based on you know facial recognition or, or micro features and things like that 
Or what about the impact of trauma on memory and the fact that we know that people don't necessarily relay information in a linear way? I think it's very clear that the individual, the human being, as you say, um, is not really at the center of, of this kind of technological development at all. In fact, it is definitely an afterthought. And it's a clear way to, again, reinscribe the way that, that power operates in society. There's certain actors that get to decide what counts as innovation and other actors and other communities are relegated to being the testing ground for that. Thank you. And um, there's been another question in the chat, actually, sort of about the design um, of the algorithms. Um, um, do you have any insights on the characteristics of the producers of the automatic data analysis programs actually used by Frontex in this question? So either Chris or, or Petra, but, um, but yeah, it seems that the, the design and the um, blind spots, I suppose, in the designers is really important to this, um, to the impacts. I mean, I can speak generally to some of the issues around around this, and then perhaps, Chris, if you know anything specific about the Frontex use, please go ahead. But this is such an important question, again, to, to think about who, which, which actors, again, are the ones that are developing this technology. Um, and the private sector plays a huge role here, partly because, you know, public sector and states sometimes don't have the in-house expertise to be able to develop algorithms and automated decision making, and therefore over rely on the private sector, which, of course, has very different reasons and different bottom lines um, and also operates in a different legal um, sphere of accountability and responsibility. And one of the concerns here is precisely this, this issue of responsibility laundering or less colloquially put passing the hot potato back and forth when things go wrong because the public sector can oftentimes say, well, you know, it's, it's not really our responsibility. We didn't develop this. And the private sector will go, you know what, not our responsibility either, because we are shielded by a bunch of corporate laws, intellectual property, etc. But again, what happens to the individual in question when something goes wrong and when people are, for example, wrongly deported, as already happened in the UK to over 7,000 students that were accused of cheating on a language acquisition algorithm that made a mistake? What if you're deported and an algorithm makes a mistake? Who's actually responsible, right? Is it the designer, the coder? The immigration officer using it? Is it the algorithm itself? Should an algorithm have legal personality? I mean, it's getting a little facetious, but I think these questions are important to ask, particularly because we're getting at this issue around who actually is responsible. And just to loop it back to your question, the private sector is a major, major player here. And, you know, um, groups like Privacy International, for example, has been doing incredible work on trying to track what some of these uh, companies are doing and how they're implicated in some of this migration management technology. Let me just pull um, some uh, examples from them and I can put it in the chat as well. I could just add to that. Um, in terms of the sort of accountability issue, there is um, a very clear example from a different realm, but um, with regards to police's use of facial recognition technology in the UK, um, there is a chap called Ed Bridges who lives in Cardiff who took South Wales police to court for their use of facial recognition technology. They used technology made by NEC um, and there was an attempt to find out whether the, their algorithms were biased in any way um, towards race or gender or against certain races and genders. Um, and NEC were able to say before the court, well, we're not going to release that because it's a trade secret. Um, so you see exactly the kind of issue that comes up when when you have this interface between the public and private sector on in this sort of sensitive or well, when literally you're dealing with sensitive data um that you know that there's a possibility to hide behind um trade secrets for, you know before you reach accountability thank you um so our next question is what plans are there to download retain and track information on mobile phones of asylum seekers and in which countries is this already the practice um yeah if, if anyone has any any um information about that that would be very interesting i do i was actually just learning about this for a report and again i'm totally going to plug privacy international they did some great work on trying to track this and i just looked up our report so that i can give you the hot off the press um countries that have been doing it if you're interested there's definitely been documented um, smartphone scraping and tracking in a variety of countries in the EU. So for example, and I, I'll drop the link to this in the chat as well, so you can read it yourselves. 
Um, Austria, Germany, Denmark, Norway, UK, and Belgium all allow for the use of um, seizure of mobile phones and tracking, which again is really problematic that that is so normalized, right? I mean, of course, the border space, anytime any of us crosses, we are at risk of having our technology looked at and seized. And that's often a problem for refugee lawyers with sensitive case information on our computer. I've definitely had to fight a border guard once or twice to not open my own computer. But it's, it's definitely something that, again, that contextual understanding is key here because oftentimes so much information is stored on an asylum seeker or refugee's phone and it's also their only connection oftentimes to home, right? And again, what kind of negative inferences will be made if someone refuses to share their phone? Will they immediately then become a high risk um, you know, person or a case that needs to go through further scrutiny just because of you know, wanting to opt out of having um, their, their cell phone data scraped? So it's, yeah, it's just, it's an, it's an interesting and a very problematic twist to this as well, because again, it pushes the border and the border kind of making apparatus even further afield. It's almost like the border has now become our smartphone. Um, so this is definitely a frontier that I think we all need to pay more attention to. But let me find these resources and I will put them in the chat. Thank you. I wonder, so I think it was interesting, you know, that in theory, we're all kind of vulnerable to that, but often like we might have a choice. And I wondered, you know, like you, you were able to argue with the border guard. Um, one of our questions is about whether you encountered reports of um, asylum seekers or migrants, mobile phones being confiscated, um, like as well as requesting access, like whether that was, a, whether you've come across that being, uh, being for, enforced. That wasn't something that came up in my conversations, um, which is interesting. I wonder why. I mean, it was also partly because I wasn't really uh, centering the conversations around this particular piece, but it's a good reminder for me as well to not forget to ask about um, this particular uh, invasive practice. But definitely I will, I will make sure that we, we incorporate this into our project moving forward. Thank you. I think you've got another another question before I let you look up those links. Um, are you also investigating which private companies are supplying the EU with algorithms and automated decision making? Asks Anna. Yeah, again, I mean, this is definitely a piece to the work in order to understand the kind of systemic ecosystem in which all of this works. Um, our work for sure touches on it because, again, it would be incomplete to, without trying to understand, you know, how different companies like Elbit Systems, Celebrite, most recently Anduril. Um, I feel like all these names also are Tolkien references. I don't know what's up with that, whether it's these like tech nerds being obsessed with Lord of the Rings and then using these names to name their companies. Um, there's all sorts of, you know, there's a paper waiting to be written on the intersection between Tolkien and migration management tech, but maybe that's for next year. Um, anyways, jokes aside, yeah, definitely we're looking at it. Privacy International also has looked into it and I know State Watch also. It's, it's trying to understand though how these private actors and entities operate and how this technology crosses borders is also really difficult because it can be developed in one particular jurisdiction for a particular use case. For example, the tracking of Palestinians in the West Bank by Elbit and then sold to a buyer somewhere in the EU and then reused and retooled for a completely different application somewhere else. It's very, very difficult to, to get a sense of how the private entities in this space um, operate. I would be curious to hear what Statewatch thinks about this because it's for, for us, this is something very difficult um, to, to get an understanding of how this fits into it. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's it's hard to know, isn't it? Um, precisely what private companies are doing. I mean, there's also, I think, there is also a lot more of a um, interaction between the public and private sectors than is often assumed. I mean, you know, if you an awful lot of public money goes into research, um, which benefits the private sector, including in algorithmic development, um, data analysis, and things like that. So, for example, if you look at at uh, Horizon 2020, the EU's research program, um, and there's various themes that are relevant to this. There's the IT, IT theme, and in particular the security theme um, that received 1.7 billion euros between 2014 and the end of 2020. And there's an awful lot of projects in there um, geared towards AI, um, you know, using big data, um, predictive uh, algorithms, and so on. And these are these projects almost always um, 
uh, bringing together of public and private entities with the specific aim of supplying eventually, whether maybe not immediately out of the project, but eventually um, using the results to supply technologies mostly to the public sector, to police forces and border guards and things like that. Um, so, you know, there's, it's like when people talk about, you know, the internet or oh, the iPhone wouldn't exist without public investment in research um, over the last three or four decades to invent things like GPS and the internet and so on. And I suspect there's something similar going on here. I mean, I don't think all private companies are entirely dependent on the, the public sector or taxpayers' money, but there's certainly a lot of interaction between the two. Um, and there's a lot more investigation to be done in how that plays out, particularly with regard to migration, so migration technologies, as it were. Thank you. So I think we've got, there's two questions left in the Q&A. Um, I think we might just have time for them both before we wrap up. So I'll um, so I'll move on to the first of those. Um, as regards automated decision making specifically, and besides the EU passenger name record directive, are there any similar, any other similar schemes implemented in the field of migration management? The question is specifically about automated decision making schemes, not systems like the SIS, VIS, Eurodac, etc. Yeah, so we, we list some of these systems um, in, in our report, um, but it definitely, it's an interesting time to try and track what is happening because it's, it's becoming clear that various jurisdictions in the EU are interested in using different facets of automated decision making in its immigration and refugee processing, but it's not yet quite clear how this is going to work because it is definitely very much a piecemeal effort right now. Um, it's also fascinating, again, from a geopolitical perspective, because there's other entities and other countries, too, that are experimenting with this. Uh, the UK, for example, was using um, a visa algorithm to try and uh, triage uh, a variety of applications. And then through a legal action that was brought, um, they basically stopped doing that. Um, Canada, US, and, and different different parts. Uh, I know Germany has a has an idea uh, to try and implement some automated decision making in a, in immigration applications, but definitely more work needs to be done in terms of stitching this all together to see how this will all work. Particularly because in the EU, it's much more difficult when it comes to demarcating different parts of a person's immigration journey, as opposed to you know a. Uh, a receiving country like Australia or Canada, where our immigration system works in a very different way. Um, definitely watch out for this in, in our report, but it's an area that we're trying to track um, and just to have a, a pan EU wide uh, understanding of how these systems are, are being talked about and, and also how research fits into it too, because, you know, just to pick up on what Chris was saying, a lot of automated decision making and AI, it's kind of the sexy topic these days. And there's so much money that's uh, funneled into this. And I think the next, maybe two, three years are going to be quite key as we see a rollout of this type of technology um, more and more in, in different jurisdictions across the EU. If I could just add to that as well, um, to Georgios, uh, you can, yeah, you can look at the report we published in July called Automated Suspicion, um, which does look at systems like the VIS, you say, well, don't mention the VIS, but actually, in the new version of the VIS, an automated uh, decision-making scheme will be incorporated into it, um, along with the travel information and authorization system. Um, so those are two EU level schemes that deal with this. I forgot about another report, actually. I will also stick it in there. It's, uh, it's about facial recognition specifically and using automated decision-making that's powered by facial recognition. It was just done by a, an amazing legal clinic in Canada but it's not just Canada focused, it looks at kind of facial recognition, broadly speaking. So I'm going to find that and put it in the chat as well. Thank you. Um, I think we might um, not have time for all of the questions that we have, but um, please do get in touch if we, if you do have a question that you really want us to address, um, uh, you can get in touch with us at State Watch or with Petra, um, who has posted her email address in the chat. Um, so, I'll do, we've got one minute to answer one last question. Um, for individuals granted refugee status, how are they likely to be affected by the extensive collection of their data and its storage in EU-wide databases when they later navigate life, e.g. when they seek employment or housing in the member state? Um, this is particularly for minors, um, individuals who are minors during the process. Um, if I am right, 
and I'm willing to be wrong. Uh, when someone is granted refugee status, their data is supposed to be removed from Eurodac, I think. Um, although it may be kept in like a side pocket in case it's required for law enforcement access over a certain number of years subsequent to them receiving um, status. Um, but I would have to check that. I believe that's the case. If I may also, um, we had a comment in the chat saying, you know, um, it's not just states that are using technology, but also, you know, people on the move, migrant smugglers uh, are making use of Facebook groups, um, the dark web to sell fake documents. Uh, this is very true. Um, and that's a very interesting area of investigation, I think, and how that how that works and plays out. But at the same time, uh, those people have far less power than states, international organizations who are using technology um, to try and control those people's movements, which um, for us at least is, a, is what we're here to research and try and expose. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you both Chris and Petra for your, um, for your discussion just now. It was very illuminating. Um, and thank you very much to all of our audience for attending today and for your really insightful questions. Um, yeah, and I'll say a huge thank you um, to Niovi in her absence as well um, for her uh, really interesting intervention that started us off today. Um, and a huge thank you to Jess at the Transnational Institute, who, as always, has uh, made sure we had a really smooth um, webinar. Um, so our next webinar from State Watch will be the final one in this series of, on the Deportation Union report. That will be on the 14th of December, exploring Frontex's growing role in deportations um, in more depth. Um, we will hear from Mariana Cliatti and myself and one other speaker who um, will be announced soon. Um, on, if you're after something a little bit sooner than the 14th of December, then the Transnational Institute actually has um, uh, their next webinar tomorrow. Uh, that's at six o'clock Central European time, uh, hosted by TNI and Clasco. This is the New Radicals, um, bringing together a unique panel of young activists from across Latin America to talk about their struggles and proposals. What are their priorities? What is their message? And what lessons can we learn from them? Uh, this will be in Spanish and there'll be a live interpretation into English and Portuguese for anyone who's interested. Um, and then on the 10th of November, TNI will be hosting a webinar on the impact of the US election, which I'm sure uh, many of us will be following with interest um, over the next few weeks. Um, yeah, and if you have enjoyed today's webinar and want to reach out to or support um, State Watch or the Transnational Institute, then you can find uh, support pages um, on the slide on the slides or in the chat um, and also on our websites. Um, and we'd always love to hear from you um, with any suggestions. And um, we also do have a, um, a questionnaire that we would um, really love you to fill out very quickly about um, about today's webinar. So I'll just share that in the chat now. We'll also share it in um, our thank you email, um, just um, to let us know a little bit more about what you think of the webinar and how we can improve in the future. So it won't take long and it would be really helpful if you could fill that out. So thank you very much. Um, yes, and I think you've seen some slides about further reading. Um, if you've had um, any interest piqued by today's webinar and please do get in touch with any further questions um, that we can um, answer by email or by phone call. Uh, yes, so thank you all very much for coming. It's, um, it's been great to have you and to hear your questions and thanks again to our amazing panellists um, for your thoughtful presentations and answers.